I wanted to, to uh, talk with you about idea today was this idea that the government is behind. You know, you look at the, the technology that's available in the private sector today to ordinary citizens, and it seems to me that it's way ahead of you know the, the technology that's experienced by people in government. And a lot of when I talk about government as a platform, it means government sort of in some sense catching up to the way the rest of the world works. And you guys are really leading that charge to catch government up. So maybe you could talk to us about how you're thinking about that. Well, Tim, let me uh, start by broadening the question. Yeah. Because the technology gap that we're seeing rests not just sort of within uh, the federal offices, but also extends into the economy writ large. When you look at the pace of change in our broader competitiveness uh, agenda, you see that we have a lot of room for improvement to close the technology gap more, more, more broadly. So I would start the conversation by saying, and perhaps uh, what we'll do is Vivek and I will kind of riff on a couple of these elements, that there are a couple of areas that are more broadly speaking uh, where we see gaps. And then we'll get to your narrow question about, about the government in a minute. First, first and foremost, we have an infrastructure question in the country. That is, as more and more of our uh, citizenry is engaged in mobile activity, do we have sufficient infrastructure that will power this mobile broadband revolution? So one of the gaps that has us up at night is to the degree to which we might face a, a, a shortage, if you will, in the amount of available spectrum. A second and related... Uh, so, and do you have an answer to that? Do you think we do? Well, yeah. The president uh, uh, announced a uh, commitment uh, by this administration that over the next 10 years, we will effectively double the amount of spectrum that's available for mobile broadband. That's roughly 500 megahertz of spectrum that we intend to make available through modern tools like auctions so that the best economic use of that spectrum is uh, enabled. So what, what about modern tools like just pure unlicensed white space spectrum that anybody can use for any purpose? And that's a, that is absolutely in the president's plan. We actually call for uh, basically three key uh, innovations. Innovation number one is the use of auctions to make sure that we have uh, that asset move to its highest and best use. That we use advanced uh, technologies specifically in the area of shared spectrum so that we can do more with uh, how various agencies who own Spectrum today and those who are in the private sector that own Spectrum can actually collaborate in a manner that allows them to retain some of those rights but to free up uses for mobile broadband. So shared Spectrum is called out by the president as a key priority. And third is ensuring that we have this robust and vibrant uh, uh, asset base that can be used for unlicensed uh, innovation. All of that is part of the president's uh, commitment. We'll be providing more detail on this Spectrum initiative uh, by October 1st when the Commerce Department will release its framework in collaboration with the uh, Federal Communications Commission. So I took you a little bit off of your storyline about advanced IT infrastructure. So well, that was because well, Spectrum, got, Spectrum was just one piece of it. You've got the vision right in front of you. And folks, just for your, your background, uh, Vivek and I have been uh, teaming up in every possible manner to ensure that our strategies inside and outside of the government are harmonized in a manner that will take advantage of this president's call for uh, breakthroughs in the economy. And that framework is what, what Tim was, was alluding to. It began with the question of do we have sufficient uh, advanced IT infrastructure, and Spectrum is our top priority. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Vivek in a minute, but on the second of those areas, Tim, uh, we see the marriage of research and development and our government strategy as an important component of, of how to close this technology gap, and no better than in the area of cloud computing. Uh, I'll just share briefly, the National Science Foundation in 2007 had funded a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, who thought to think about new and creative ways to expand essentially the Amazon uh, Web Services framework, to apply it in the research context. And as a result of his activity, they commercialized a, 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 an open source stack called Eucalyptus and built a, a, a private company that would actually help to promote the use of Eucalyptus as a framework for, for cl uh, cloud computing environments that are either privately run or hybrid. And that framework is actually at the heart of some of the cloud computing work that Vivek's doing, and it's a great segue 
into this particular gap as how the research and development investment from 2007 by 2010 is up and running. Martin Miko's happy. He's my old friend from uh, MySQL. He's now the CEO of Eucalyptus. <laughs> Well, well, I mean, to go back to your original question, part of the collaboration here between the roles of the CIO and CTO is, is to figure out how we drive fundamental change in the way the government operates and the broader economy. So when we think of cloud computing, for example, why is that important? Well, consider this. If you're starting up a company, uh, let's say in Silicon Valley, and you went to a venture capitalist and you said, you know what, I need about six months and $10 million because I need to stand up an email system, I need to stand up an ERP system, I need to get an uh, accounting system online, I'm sure most VCs would say, what are you talking about, right? Because most startups now are leveraging cloud solutions, whether they're getting uh, email online for free or they're signing up for uh, QuickBooks or they're leveraging Intuit, you name it. Unfortunately, in the public sector, what we've done is we've bought technology in ways that contribute to widening this gap between the private sector and the public sector. Consider this, in our day-to-day -day lives, we go online, whether we're making a reservation uh, for our favorite uh, restaurant or hotel or uh, airline ticket, yet when you're dealing with government, you've got to stand in line, you've got to hold on the phone, or you've got to send in a complicated form. Part of what we're doing in terms of the infrastructure is we're trying to get the CIOs to abstract across the federal government away from building yet another data center, yet more infrastructure investments, but really focusing on the intersection of how the American people deal with their government. And cloud computing is one area. So what Anish was talking about in terms of eucalyptus, uh, we leverage the Nebula platform that was developed as a result of some of the NSF funding to launch U.S. spending on top of that platform, among other services. The other area we're really focused on is this notion of open data. What we've got to be able to do is democratize data faster. Uh, we've made a lot of progress in this space, but we need to continue to double down on those investments as each of the agencies continue to invest, whether it's on their back-end systems or in processes to release this data so that we could drive innovation uh, by third parties rather than just government employees. One of the concerns I have about uh, open data in a government context is there, there seem to be a lot of uh, limits on what you guys can do. You know, in the private sector, companies push the boundaries all the time, and sometimes they get it wrong. The marketplace reacts, and they have to pull back. We've seen this, for example, say with Facebook and some of the things they've done around uh, uh, releasing, you know, personal data, the changing in their, their, their terms of service. But that's kind of a natural, easy process. Whereas in government, there are so many things that you go, wow, we could do that, except, oh, oh we can't because this regulation or that regulation. And I, I think uh, about that, for example, in healthcare, you know, where we know that if we instrumented our healthcare system the way Google instruments advertising, you know, we could save lives. We could reduce costs, you know, because we'd be able to see the patterns in what works and what doesn't, what procedures are being overused, what procedures are being underused, and yet we can't do that because, you know, we're afraid uh, that we might breach some kind of privacy regulation or whatever. So how do we think about, you know, modernizing this, our open data infrastructure in the government context where there are so many constraints that you don't necessarily start with in the private sector? Well, let me, let me suggest there are two pieces to this question, and it's a topic that you picked that's near and dear to our hearts. Part A is how we build voluntary consensus-driven standards in the private sector on how to go about sharing this information right. in a manner that leads to value. And then the second is what do we do with government-held uh, data assets? And I will share with you that you have to have both moving at the same pace. Just as a quick, quick aside, August 2nd, President Obama flew to Atlanta and he addressed the disabled veterans of America. And he made a pledge that this fall, every member of the active duty or the, the, uh, the, the veterans population, this fall will have access to a little blue button yeah. that will allow them to download their own data. And if they chose to give it to a third party or do something with it that could be then aggregated for analysis, it's their choice. That went live in a soft launch 
without any fanfare about a week ago. And I think you've either had Peter here talking or no, he will. We, we talked with Todd Park about it. You talking about oh, it? Yeah. Man, we got over 10,000 people have downloaded this thing in a week yeah. or whatever. So that's government held data. And, and that we made it through within the constraints of I think of there's privacy. a really interesting uh, point you make, which is, is sort of an architectural design. That is, if you give the data to the individual and then the individual can give it to someone else, uh, that's a really interesting way rather than, so, oh, well, we're going to give your data away. Well, the, the other thing to think about here is, uh, so, so the federal government spends about $80 billion annually on information technology. And the underlying architecture of all these systems, they presume a closed, secretive, opaque environment. This is the first time what's happening across the government as the two of us are partnering. What we're doing is we're rising to the president's call of an open, transparent, and participatory government where we're shifting power away just from a single contracting officer or a single system owner who says this is closed within the four walls of this agency, whether it's this data or these systems. Mm -hmm. And that change, in my mind, is more of a cultural, fundamental change than it is from a technology perspective. So, so you're absolutely right. In the beginning, when yeah. we began with the Open Government Directive, when we're pushing hard for data to be democratized, all the issues people are raising were around systems and the Paperwork Reduction Act. Right. They're talking about cookies policies, you name it. But what we've done over the last 18 plus months is we've gone line item by line item addressing a lot of those issues. Now what you're seeing as part of the budgeting process, as part of this culture that we're changing, we're making sure investments across the federal government and also, and you can talk about the broader economy, that uh, those investments are being made with an open architecture in mind and shifting power to the American people rather than to a single government agency or a contracting officer. And I mean, one thing, just for the group who wants to, okay, this all sounds great, but give me some more detail. In the midst of health reform implementation, which as you know is one of this president's top priorities, we were asked to put together a, a technical framework for how to enroll individuals in this ecosystem. How do we know who should be eligible for what program and all the rest? We've taken a, a tremendous amount of public input and synthesized that into like a 15-page report. And I would encourage all of you to go to healthit.hhs.gov and take a look at the recommendations for what's referred to as the Section, section 1561 workgroup. Because it explicitly describes exactly the challenges you're facing. How will we go about, not just at the federal level, but federal, state, and local, and nonprofits, and ecosystems to per really ensure that the right person gets the right level of health insurance support at the right time? Uh, that framework, uh, I would put that to the test for a discussion to reflect the values that we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. So let me just um, ask you uh, about adoption. I, I was looking at uh, a survey. Uh, a little while back from Information Week government that claimed that only 14% of their survey respondents said that cloud computing was extremely important uh, to them. And you know, yeah, you're pushing it. Uh, how much resistance are you getting from agencies for, you know, to cloud computing, open data? Uh, you know, and, and how much of a big stick does the IT dashboard give you? Well, so, so let's, uh, let me start with the IT dashboard yeah. and, um, and, and what it's led to so far. And we're still, you know, as we, as we look at uh, the IT dashboard, it's been deployed for a little over a year now. What we've already seen, for example, right after we launched it at the VA, 45 IT projects were halted, 12 of them were terminated. We started these text at accountability sessions in January. Following that, the first tech stat session we did was actually on EPS financial system, which was over two years behind schedule, $30 million over budget. We dug deeper, and what we saw across the board was that most financial systems across the federal government were either behind schedule or over budget. We halted over 30 financial systems across the federal government. That's about $20 billion in life cycle costs. We recently also announced that uh, we're focusing on 26 IT projects, major IT projects across the federal government. This is from infrastructure at $7.5 billion at the Department of Interior to systems that uh, focus on uh, agriculture and healthcare. 
And this was about $30 billion worth of IT investments. Now, there are serious consequences as a result of that. We're being good stewards of taxpayer dollars as a result of just shining light on how these IT investments are performing and then acting on them, actually doing something about projects that are not on budget, not on schedule, rather than continuing to throw good money after bad money. Mm -hmm. As far as resistance is concerned, I mean, this is a huge change as far as uh, how you manage across the government. For the first time, what's happening is the White House is looking at the same information the American people are. And not only that, but we're actually getting input from the American people in terms of how to effectively manage these projects that are having a direct feedback loop in terms of the decisions we're making that have a long-term impact. So this is your accountable government uh, uh, pillar. Pillar. Uh, uh, and your, on and, your but Tim, draw one distinction. Yeah. It's one thing to survey the tech leadership at the agencies and their views. It's another to ask the chiefs of staff of the major cabinet agencies, the deputy secretaries who often act as a chief operating officer. I think if you were polling that group, uh, they would say without any hesitation that they're falling lock, stock, and barrel in support of this vision because they actually believe it will deliver better value yeah. for, the, for the things that they're held accountable for. So I'd be a little bit careful about well, how to, well, I, who's actually, being surveyed and how. No, I understand. I, I mentioned this in my opening remarks also. Yeah. I really believe that this technology wave is coming whether IT managers like it or not. And it was certainly an era, I'm old enough to remember when, you know, all the guys who managed Glasshouse IT thought the PC was never gonna come into their corporations or when the internet was gonna be, never gonna, you know, <laughs> be used by their company. And sure enough, uh, it didn't really matter what they thought. <laughs> but, but I think what's also important to point out is that this is not some just abstract statement that we're making in terms of a move to the cloud, consolidation of infrastructure, focusing on management of these projects. This is directly tied to the budget processes. So there are financial consequences um, if these projects aren't performing, if these shifts aren't happening. Uh, and not only that, but this isn't being done uh, you know, behind closed doors. It's open, it's transparent, it's participatory, so people can actually see the right. results that are being produced. So, so far you've, you've suspended projects. You have, have you actually canceled any? Absolutely. So 12 projects were terminated at the VA. We actually just canceled the financial system uh, that was behind schedule, way over budget. Uh, we've halted and we've turned around. Look, ultimately, it's not about just canceling projects. Mm -hmm. We've demonstrated you know, that in this administration, we will take on wasteful spending and terminate projects that don't produce dividends. Yeah. The ultimate goal is to actually make sure that the dollars we're spending on information technology produce the dividends that the American people expect, that we don't continue to throw hundreds of millions of dollars. We canceled the v, uh, a Department of Defense project where DOD had spent 12 years and about a billion dollars on an integrated human resource system that was terminated this year. We've gone after wasteful spending across these agencies, but what we're trying to really do is find the third way in terms of making sure that we don't continue to buy technology in the same ways we've been buying, and that we actually try to close this technology gap that we were talking about by introducing Darwinian pressure in federal IT, the same Darwinian pressure that we see in consumer IT. So here's the framework, Tim. Here's the bottom line. We see in the private sector and in the public sector a need to close this broader technology gap. We are deeply focused on ensuring there's sufficient IT infrastructure in the country around spectrum. We're ensuring that we have the right relationship that brings our research and development agenda and our uh, operational needs and the first manifestation of that is in cloud computing. We're defaulting to open data as a philosophy. You've heard a phenomenal push by Vivek on open and accountable government. And we've got a process where we're doing more of the government as convener to bring people together in the private sector to set up consensus-driven standards. That is insufficient to close the technology gap. And what we're pleased to celebrate today is that if you have the platforms, but you're kind of disorganized in how they're being used, you're going to see success in a one-off basis. But you're not going to see that kind of structural change within the federal uh, agencies and hopefully state and local that we think we need to make this successful. And that's why Vivek and I are so pleased today to announce the launch of our next pillar, the pillar that will close the gap because it'll build out accountable, results-oriented ecosystems 
that are fueled by grassroots, bottoms-up organizations in the public, whether they be organized by private sector industry groups like in healthcare IT or the general population. We wanted an organized model that would take all of these components we've described and engage the American people in new and creative ways to solve real and practical problems. So today, Vivek and I are celebrating the launch of challenge.gov, one of our first contests that will be released. You can give it, hey, give it some love. Come on now. <laughs> And the basic idea is from super complicated to very simple. We want to make sure that everybody has a chance to participate. And I'll let Vivek take a, a minute to describe the, the, the framework here. But just to give you the first shot across the bow, when the Office of Management and Budget, as part of the Open Government Directive, said prizes and competition policy are an important part of open government, the first person to sign up to issue a challenge was our first lady, and our first lady said, what I want to do is challenge the developer community to build games or applications that will help kids learn about nutritional value as they go about their uh, daily lives. We're close to announcing the winners of that, hopefully by the end of the month. But that process is underway. But the, the Let's Move campaign, which is the first lady's uh, 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 program, was so enthusiastic about this launch of challenge.gov, she wanted to be the first to sign up for this wave. And so we're pleased to celebrate the Let's Move campaign's Recipes for Healthy Kids competition. This is very simple. We want kids and school districts across the country to organize around the right healthy food options for their school district and that those best recipes will be competed in a collaborative and grassroots way. That's the spirit of uh, challenge.gov, and, and Vivek can then frame it for us more broadly and bring up sure. our so, detail. So more broadly speaking, what we've got is over 30 challenges that, that are online today as we speak on challenge.gov across over 15 agencies. And this is a fundamental shift in power again. In the same way that open data is moving ownership of information to the American people, what challenge.gov does is it engages the American people to be co-creators uh, in creating solutions to some of the toughest problems this country faces. So I encourage all of you to get on challenge.gov. You don't have to just go online to come up with a solution. You can always also vote for problems or challenges that you're interested in so that everybody can participate and help us address some of the toughest problems we face as a country. All right. Thanks, Tim. Thank you very Thank much. You. Come on, Al. Right. Let's do all it. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you.